2020 was a year that happened. A year that gave us such great moments like... And... Popcorn Punch! But 2020 was also a year that gave us quite a few good games as well. So much so that it actually made it one of my favourite years for games since 2013. Loads of great releases. So much so that it made making a game of the year list for this year actually really difficult. But, well, I can't bring myself to not make this list. So, here's my game of the year list for 2020. Starting off with number 5 is none other than Doom Eternal. Doom Eternal being at 5th honestly says a lot to me about how good 2020 was for games. I loved Doom Eternal. Honestly, it felt like the perfect sequel to Doom 2016, which was actually my game of the year for that year. The gameplay is just so much more fluid and addictive than what came before it. The addition of the dash and the grapple hook on the super shotgun just helps make each encounter feel much more fast paced whilst you're trying to avoid these swarms of demons attacking you. The game is definitely much harder than Doom 2016, but it never feels like you're weaker than in Doom 2016. Much more so the opposite thanks to the small additions such as demon weak points, which makes killing enemies faster if you exploit their weaknesses. Nearly everything about Doom Eternal feels like it was fine tuned just to be as fun as possible. Except the first two hours of the game and its multiplayer. Honestly, the only reason Doom Eternal ranks at 5th on the list and not higher is because I actually found the first two hours of Doom Eternal to be actually pretty bad. This could be because I went in expecting it to be like exactly like Doom 2016, which it's not. But some changes just didn't really click with me really well at the start, such as the removal of melee damage, which I don't get why you can't just punch a demon into a glory kills, it's, it still baffles me. But later on in the game, it does work, I guess, when you get all these new abilities. But for first impressions, though, eh, I wasn't too thrilled. And also, the battle mode in the game feels really meh. It's not bad, but I actually preferred the multiplayer to Doom 2016, which actually makes me one of the few people who too like that. But overall, Doom Eternal was a superb sequel, and I honestly cannot wait to see what ID have got up for us next. And number four is Hades, a game which caught me completely off guard. I went into this game expecting nothing more than just another Biden numbers roguelike, and boy, was I wrong. This is easily my favourite roguelike I've ever played. This is so good in fact that I'd actually struggle to play any other roguelike now, because i just rather play Hades. The gameplay here is near perfect. The fact that you start off with no chance of being able to beat the game, then slowly progress thanks to the upgrades and new weapons, it's a game which is extremely rewarding. Every single new run you do gives you this extra bit of motivation. Are you stuck on a boss? Just upgrade a few abilities or get the right upgrades that you occasionally find in the encounters and boom, who knows, maybe you'll be able to get the boss beaten. Each boss I enjoyed a lot, especially once you beat them. I found it to be as rewarding as beating a boss from Dark Souls. Just the rush knowing that you can finally progress to the next area was just exhilarating. And to top that off, the characters in the world feel extremely fleshed out for a roguelike. Like, it never feels like an element of Hades was ignored, and that the developers truly wanted the best out of the game. And yeah, they 100% succeeded in making a game that is very goddamn fun. And now we hit the top three. And as I said before, making this list was extremely difficult, as the games I loved this year, I really loved. Whilst placing Doom Eternal and Hades was difficult, I could see nitpicks that were big enough for me to place them, like, not in the top three. But the top three games now? I had very little that I hated about them, and I honestly was just tempted to go fuck it and place them all at number one, because these games in each of their own really hit hard for me. But in the end I had to make the decision, and the game that got third is none other than The Last of Us Part 2. This is a controversial pick for many. The idea of liking The Last of Us Part 2 is considered like blasphemy by like, everyone it seems. Mostly because the story in the game is fucked, and honestly it is. The Last of Us Part 2 is not a game for everyone. It is depressing. Like, I don't know if I've played a game that makes you feel this shitty. It's extremely dark, and the brutality in the game is honestly shocking. This isn't a game without its flaws in some ways, but to me, the issues are just so minuscule that I honestly find this game to be a 10 and a worthy sequel to The Last of Us, which was probably my favourite story game of the 7th generation of consoles. I enjoyed the story a lot. Whilst I'm not too sure if I'd say I preferred it to part 1, as there are some flaws with it, such as the fact that some scenes can feel unnecessary, and maybe it is a bit too long for its own goods, as it is like 25 hours long. I definitely didn't find it to be that far off though, and more to the point of it, it certainly wasn't terrible. A lot of the backlash feels unwarranted in many ways to me. Like, sure, there are moments which you can be mad about, but I wouldn't say these were moments that ruined the game. Also, the gameplay here is easily Naughty Dog's best. The gameplay here is just brutal. It makes Man 2 at times look like fucking child's play. Especially with how when you kill someone, another enemy will just shout their name or something. The stealth encounters are also really well done. In Last of Us Part 1, it sort of felt tacky at times, but here I never had an issue with it. 
Honestly, the biggest issue I had with Last of Us Part 2 was the addition of the new infected type, the Shambler, and even then it was just a major nitpick just by me. Taking second place this year is a game that I went in expecting just to play and enjoy, but not expect anything Game of the Year worthy, but well, I was definitely wrong with that decision. And aside from a few nitpicks, this game was very nearly my Game of the Year, that being Yakuza Like a Dragon. Whilst making this list, I always had an issue with Yakuza Like a Dragon, because I genuinely didn't know where to place this at all. I fucking love this game. It's a game which is so batshit goofy at times, it gets serious. Like, who the hell wrote this game? And more to the point of that, how the hell did the series get approved by actual Yakuza? In this game you will at one moment be fighting a group of Yakuza who want you dead, and the next you'll be fighting a chimpanzee controlling a bulldozer. And no, I didn't make that up. It's a game which whilst it can take itself seriously, won't always, and I love it for it. The side content is easily the star of the Yakuza, because it's silly, and really there is no better word to explain it than the word silly. But the main story of Yakuza Like a Dragon is also extremely well written and plotted. It actually battles with some pretty big themes I'd say, which weirdly works well as serving as a contrast to the rest of the game. I found Ichiban Kasuga to also be a lovable goofball and I honestly cannot wait to see him in the next Yakuza game hopefully. The Switch from its almost beat em up gameplay to a JRPG was something I actually was quite worried about, but instead it was one of my favourite things about Like a Dragon. It could honestly be my favourite JRPG I've ever played even. Before this I hadn't really given Yakuza a try, but I mean thanks to Like a Dragon I'm a fan and I honestly cannot wait to see what Sega do next with the Yakuza series. But before I call out my game of the year, I thought I'd just mention a few games that I liked a lot that just barely missed out on the list. First there is Cyberpunk 2077. This one was a game that I really was on the fence about on this list. On the one hand, I think Cyberpunk is a brilliantly realised project by CD Projekt Red, with a superb story and a fast and colourful world to explore. On the other hand though, I just found this game just to be way too buggy to even want to finish it. I was extremely hyped for this game, but it seems like my hope for the game is just going to have to wait until CD Projekt just fix the game, because at the moment I cannot bring myself to continue playing it in the state that it's in, which is a real shame because at its core, so 2077 is genuinely a game of the year contender. It could have easily gotten onto this list if not for the state that it is at the moment. There was also Sukuna of Rice and Ruin, an amazing little mix of the farming simulator and side-scrolling combat genres. I enjoyed playing this game a lot whilst I was bored, and I think it genuinely deserves a lot more recognition than it got. And finally, there is Carry On, an extremely fun yet challenging side-scrolling game which you get to play as a tentacle monster and fuck shit up. It was a game that I was very excited for and the only thing that disappointed me was the fact that it wasn't long enough, but I guess it also helps it from overstaying its welcome. There was also a lot of games that I didn't get to play this year because, believe it or not, I have to buy these games myself and I'm not given them. And one of those games, for instance, was any PS5 game, such as Demon's Souls. Because it might surprise you, but you've got a higher chance of getting a Royal Flush within your first five cards in Baker than actually finding a PS5 in stock. There's also Persona 5 Royal, which I really wanted to get, but I'm waiting for Atlas to hopefully release it on PC instead like they did with Persona 4 Golden, which I absolutely adored. Just hopefully it doesn't take them 7 or 8 years to port it to PC. Assassin's Creed Valhalla was apparently more of Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but Vikings, and I sure as hell did enjoy Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And finally there was a small game that I think some people said was alright, it was called Animal Crossing New Horizons. Eh, but I don't know, I don't think many people bought it, so those people could have just been wrong. But in the end, there could only be one game that got my game of the year for the year, and again, this wasn't an easy decision. Frankly, the only thing that separated this game from the other games was only one thing, and it was innovation. Sure, suppose the other games were innovative in their own right, either that being for its genre or series, my game of the year pick was a game that was actually innovative for a platform, and that was none other than Half-Life Alex. How the hell did Valve pull this off so well? After basically spending most of the 2010s just sitting on their arse updating Steam, CSGO and Dota, they come out of absolutely nowhere announcing this VR only Half-Life prequel, a game which honestly on paper should have had no chance of succeeding due to the hype of a Half-Life game and the fact that VR games have never been much more than a niche, but somehow Valve pulled it off not only making it extremely fun, but I would go as far to say this is Valve's best game yet. This game is easily the best VR game out there, hands down. If you've got a VR but you don't have Half-Life Alex, you should get it immediately. Loads of people were angry that this was a VR only title, but honestly after playing it, I cannot even see how this game would work without VR. It's so fine tuned for VR that it just wouldn't have that same oomph to it on PC or consoles. 
The gameplay is easily, without a doubt, the star of Half-Life Alex. It's definitely one of the most fun VR games out there in gameplay alone. The little touches to gameplay, such as the feature to flick at an object and grab it, the smooth physics on objects, the puzzles, and especially the gunplay. Half-Life Alex feels like the first true VR single player experience. Up to this point, there was only maybe Boneworks, Arizona Sunshine, and The Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners, that was considered a true single player VR experience. But even then, they just felt like little tech demos in their own way, except maybe The Walking Dead game. Half-Life Alex though felt like its own fully fledged single player VR game. Hell, this is actually the longest Half-Life game to date as well, taking about 15 hours to finish compared to the standard 10 to 12 hours. And to top that all off, Valve added workshop support to it a few months after release, which just added that much more replayability to a game which was already replayable as all hell. The audio design of this game is also superb. I'm amazed about how this game just seemed to be missing a lot of the awards just because it was a VR game, which meant it wasn't as accessible as games such as The Last of Us Part 2 or Doom Eternal, but to me it just had to be my game of the year, and I just hope that Valve can keep this up now and give us some more amazing titles such as this. Who knows, maybe a Half-Life Alex 3 or Rico Shade 2? Mm -hmm.